of Essex and Suffolk. In 1863, a rectory was built here, and just about every strange phenomena have been reported over the years. So, Peter Underwood, you are president of the Ghost Club in England, which makes you one of the leading ghost hunters. And here we are at Borley Rectory, one of the most haunted houses in the country. Is that right? Well, yes, but uh, we're not actually at, at Borley Rectory because Borley Rectory stood over there and is no longer there. But the, I'm quite convinced, beyond any shadow of doubt, that the house that stood just across the road was and fully lived up to its name as the most haunted house in England. Why? Why are you convinced? The accumulation of evidence over the years is absolutely shattering. It all began with the legend, and of course the most familiar aspect of the haunting is a ghost nun, which has been seen for something like, well, nearly a hundred years. One of the rectors even bricked up one of the windows because he said the phantom nun looked in at him having his breakfast. But over the years, phantom figures have been seen, footsteps have been heard, solid heavy footsteps on floorboards. Messages have been scribbled on the walls and on pieces of paper apparently from a French nun asking for light, mass and prayers. Bones have been found, two skulls have been found, one was buried in the churchyard, the other... Were they identified as women or female or...? One of them was identified as a young female and it's rather interesting because a dental surgeon discovered that there was a deep-seated abscess in the jawbone and nearly all the people who have reported seeing the nun have said that she appeared sad-faced, unhappy. And, of course, with the deep sea depths, she would indeed. So, really, we're talking about a, 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 a ghost of a, a nun with toothache. That's what it sounds like, yes, yes. But putting all that on one side, the fact remains, you've got the incumbences of four rectors from 1892, uh, from 1863, rather, until 1935. Four rectors, their families, wives, many friends and relatives, all of whom assert that they heard, saw and felt things which they can't explain. And I think the accumulated evidence is absolutely overwhelming that this was indeed the most haunted house in England. It was in 1937 that when the Smiths were here, uh, Smith had recently come to England from in India, and he just walked into this, and he wondered what was happening. Uh, he saw a figure, he saw a phantom coach, his lights suddenly blared up, bells rang. He didn't know what to do, and he wrote to uh, the national paper, and they sent down Harry Price, who was the leading psychic investigator at that time, and, of course, he was fascinated once he heard the story and started making inquiries. Uh, the ecclesiastical authorities decided that the house was no longer suitable for a rector to live in, and Price decided to rent it. And he rented the place for a year, arranged independent investigators who again reported identical phenomena, footsteps, lights, noises, bell ringing, and so on. Uh, and then the place was sold privately to a Crackton Grigson, and while he owned it, a uh, somewhat mysterious fire took place and the place was gutted. But the interesting thing is that once the rectory was destroyed mm. and there was no building on the site, then the entities apparently transferred their activities to the church where visiting rectors have seen figures, have heard noises. Many visitors have reported footsteps following them up the church path inside the uh, church itself. At Epping, working on the M11 motorway extension, is one of Borley's most remarkable witnesses. Mr. Crewe Hollingsworth and a team of investigators taped recordings in the church and spent many nights observing the rectory grounds. I got a team together with Roy Potter and we did uh, actually uh, on the site of the rectory. We concentrated mostly. Have you we... seen anything there? Oh yes. Uh, um, in June, I can't even remember the exact date, but in June we sighted the nun. You did? Oh yes, uh, two of us. What time was that? Uh, or I would say somewhere about quarter to two in the morning it was. It was absolutely full moon. And uh, first of all, we couldn't, uh, you know, we couldn't really... <laughs> we were astonished. But when we saw this apparition um, go through bushes and through railings and across a, uh, a trench, we knew we were really onto something. So we had an observation actually 11 minutes. And I had a... How long? 11 minutes. You watched minutes. a ghost for 11 minutes? 11 minutes, exactly. Well, I wouldn't say exactly, but around about 11 minutes. 9 to 11 minutes. Now, this, uh, I had a wonderful view of her, because uh, she came towards me, and then she stood still for some time, and I was able to have a good look at her now. Uh, she actually started on the original old nun's walk, 
which is in the back garden of some people's bungalow. And uh, she disappeared in the, the back part of their bungalow, and then she reappeared and came across into the rectory part. Actually, she finished up behind the rectory and disappeared in, the, in some shrubs there. Uh, the nun, uh, oh, uh, when she's looking at you, she's not seeing you at all. She's not seeing you. Even when she was supposed to stand there in the old days of Harry Pry, stand looking in the rectory window, she's not seeing the rectory. She's in her own period. She's seeing something that's there in her period. And that's why she appeared about a foot from the ground, which I... She wasn't on the ground? Well, she was a foot above it. Now, this was due, I'm sure, to the original level. Uh, since then, the ground has sunk. So I would say she was at the original level in, the, in her Pretty period. Pretty weird experience you're telling me about. Oh, woman, well, a woman gliding along a foot above the ground for ten minutes. Well, it, it may seem absurd to you, but I'm going by what I saw. And uh, this, of course, has been substantiated by, uh, by my chief investigator, who is a very hard-headed person, doesn't believe in this type of thing. In fact, he re reaction was to throw a brick. Throw which, a brick? Uh, yes, at her. Yes, and went right through after this. Well, that's a uh, thing to do. Well, no, I think it was a good thing to do because <laughs> it actually totally proved uh, that, that it was nothing fake. Well, actually, I got in contact with a chubby called David Ellis, who was at Cambridge University studying a scholarship in psychic research. And Ellis was that, uh, you know, he was so surprised what we were getting at Borley and uh, so thrilled. He said, well, now, uh, look, have you tried the church? Why not try and do some tape work in that church? And then we concentrated in the church and we got another person very interested in Borley and he wanted to see for himself if there was anything at Borley and he came and he got some amazing results. So we'll go in and listen to those recordings and a warning, do not adjust your television picture. Now my tape recorder is down by the tomb, what, what f um, family is this? This is the tomb of the Watergrave family who were associated with the area for many years and there's a possibility that one of this family uh, is the origin of the figure who's been described as a ghost nun. How can, how can a Waldegrave be a, a, a nun? Well, the figure has been described as having a veiled headdress and uh, it's not certain that she's a nun. Also, this um, tomb has been the scene of a number of inexplicable incidents. Uh, people have heard the sound of earth falling, of raps and taps, and even there are some reports of some of the pillars a bit moving. I'm not mm -hmm. too happy about that. Well, maybe this is what we have on this tape. No, I'll play it to you now, and we'll see if um, Phil and Hollingworth got anything like you were talking about. Our investigation was to be carried out in the church, and we came armed with tape recorders. We left the two recorders running on their own inside the building. Before locking the machines in, we searched the building. This session proved to be the most exciting one but we firmly believe we recorded the sound of a ghost stepping forward and opening something which sounds like a door. At first we thought we'd recorded the sound of the chancel door being opened, so we investigated this possibility. But neither of these sounds in any way seems to match the ghostly one. Nothing in the vicinity of the altar that we could find could account for the strange recording. We were so intrigued by these events that we returned to the church the following Saturday and spent the entire night there. Having searched the building once more, we locked the machines in. And already the atmosphere seemed to be changing. Two of the team said they felt they were being watched by somebody. Now follows the most remarkable sound of all. For quite clearly, the centre microphone picked up what obviously is a human sigh. After this, we decided to break the sequence of visits and to try again during summer conditions. We started recording about 1am, and the first tapes revealed the natural ambience of the building and nothing else. But as we entered the church at about a quarter to two, we all felt a change in atmosphere. I had a definite tingle pulsing through my body and a feeling as though a presence were pressing against my back. And yet, there was nothing horrific about it. We felt certain, however, that this run would produce results, and we were right. It's the most surprising sound we've heard to date, and we were able to locate it as originating just in front of the altar rail. Yes, 
there is anybody in this church who is trying to communicate with us, we'd be grateful if you would try and do something tonight. Perhaps you could give us some indication of how we can help you. At about 20 past three in the morning, we picked up the sound of faint rapping. The team made another random visit at the end of August. A watch was kept throughout the night on the chancel door, and this proved worthwhile. For in the small hours, a glow was observed around the door, as though a phosphorescent aura were emanating. On this occasion, the church produced yet another sound. This ended with a rather more frightening sigh. decided to keep the church manned with observers throughout the entire night. On previous occasions, we'd obtained the best results by leaving the equipment locked inside on its own, and we wondered whether the human presence might have some adverse effect on conditions. At about ten past four in the morning, three of us kept watch on the choir stall adjacent to the altar. This was to be a memorable and frightening occasion. For most of the period, there were odd clicks and taps generated in the area of the font. But as it was extremely dark, we could see nothing. Then, we began to see tiny points of light hovering on the curtain behind the font and on one of the pews about a quarter of the way down the church. At first, we thought we couldn't believe our own eyes, and each one of us thought we were suffering from fatigue until we broke the silence to speak about it. I think I must be getting tired of that. I keep seeing things. Jerry, are you watching pieces of the curtain light? closer to us. But although we stuck our ground, there were no further audible disturbances in the church, and the lights eventually vanished. As to what they mean, it's anybody's guess. But whatever they are, they are physical. The microphones prove that. Would you say that, well, as an expert, that um, these are things that are happening outside that people are observing, or that they're things that they are projecting from their own minds and think they're, they're seeing? Well, there I, I really go back to the, this atmospheric photograph theory. Mm. See, if... We, we don't, just don't know, really, but it may be that all their no, thoughts, what do you all think? their actions, mm. may be recorded on some sort of eternal tape. And under certain conditions, maybe climatic conditions, maybe in the presence of certain people, occasionally they reappear. We just don't know. That, that's I your... don't honestly think that the um, figures that are seen represent an afterlife. I think it's much more likely that it's some kind of echo of a previous life. 